Good evening. How are we all doing today? Oh, come on, people, how are we doing tonight? That's what we like to hear. Welcome. Welcome to Hammond Castle Museum. Um, for those of you who have been on this journey with us for the last five weeks, um, welcome back. For those of you who haven't been here before, what's been keeping you? What the heck? No. Nah. Nah. My name is Jim. I'm the Special Events Manager here at Hammond Castle Museum. I just wanted to go ahead and welcome you all here tonight and thank you for coming out for this, the fifth of our six-part lecture series as part of our celebration of the 400th anniversary of the founding of Gloucester, Massachusetts. Now, I do have to go ahead and give our obligatory shout out to the people who've made all this possible. First and foremost, there's one lady, I haven't seen her in the audience tonight, but without her help, this would not have been a reality. That is Ruth Pino of Remax. So shout out to you, Ruth. We love you. So. And also we've had some help from our good friends at Mass Cultural Council, Gloucester Cultural Council. And um, we have to mention Manship Artist Residency for loaning us the use of their screen. Tonight's lecture it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to tonight's lecturer, Mr. Caleb McMurphy, Hammond Castle's very own. A few things about our friend Caleb. He is originally from faraway exotic Corvallis, Oregon. That's right. He's a West Coaster. We'll forgive him for that. Now, as an undergraduate, he attended Linden State College in Lindenville, Vermont, where he graduated with a double major in film studies and history with departmental distinction in English. His senior thesis was an extended analysis of race and racism in early American silent film with a focus on the contrasting racial dynamics and broader cultural impact of the films of D.W. Griffith and Oscar Michaud. He then attended Bowling Green State University's School of Critical and Cultural Studies in Bowling Green, Ohio, where he obtained an MA in American Cultural Studies focusing his research on 20th century American countercultural politics as portrayed in the films of the 1960s and 70s, as well as on industrial labor policy in the Hollywood studio system, with a particular focus on the history of the Screen Actors Guild. After graduate school, Caleb returned to New England and was hired as a tour guide for Hammond Castle Museum's 2021 season. The following year, he was hired as the museum's director of visitor services and education and moved to our beautiful town of Gloucester, where he currently resides. He also currently serves on the board of directors of the Massachusetts Watch and Clockmakers Association. So thus, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we give you Caleb McMurphy. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim. Uh, I had a bit where I was going to thank Ruth Pino of Remax and the Mass and Gloucester Cultural Councils, as well as Mass Ship Artist Residence. Uh, but I'll reiterate those thanks. Uh, I think these sorts of thank yous can sort of turn a little cursory, but I do want to sort of highlight just how much events like this would not be possible without support from the community at large. Um, I also would like to give a special thanks to uh, the museum's special events director, James A. Craig, who has been instrumental in helping put this lecture series together. Without him, it is not an exaggeration to say that this would not be possible. If you missed the previous lectures, uh, my understanding is they will at some point be available online. This is the fifth of six. The next one will be next week, same time, same place. And uh, will be Elena Sarney uh, speaking about her new book about the Folly Cove designers, which comes out in August. So uh, I just thought I'd give a little bit of an acknowledgement to that uh, as well. We'd love to see you again next week. So our lecture tonight. From Beauport to Fenway Court, five houses at the twilight of Gloucester's Gold Coast era. We're going to cover a lot of ground tonight, uh, starting with some of the city's very early history up until even the present day. We're going to hit a lot of different things. Some of them have to do with local stuff. Some of them have to do with more general stuff. But at the core is going to be these five houses and the five people that helped to build and occupy them. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Jim mentioned that I'm from Corvallis, Oregon, and I thought it would be a good idea to sort of start out with an acknowledgement of the fact that I am 
uh, that dreaded thing of all things, a city outsider, right, uh, <laughs> talking about local history. And let me tell you that I think that Gloucester especially is very difficult to do that again. I think it's maybe a thing that we a little bit miss out on because we're right in the middle of it. But this town has a profound sense of its own historical identity, one that is utterly alien to me where I'm from. Corvallis, the town, was first settled in 1845, right? But at that point, uh, Gloucester had already celebrated 200 years and counting of, of time. It wasn't even established as a town until 1857. We have like a nice courthouse that's vaguely historical, right? Uh, but when you come to Gloucester, you start to learn that not only is there this kind of general sense of history pervading, you know, every street, much as there is in any kind of New England town, but you talk to any random person off the street. I could probably call on any one of you who lives here, and you'd have some sort of uh, very complex historical factoid uh, knowledge about some random building. Like, sometimes it's people. You know, it's it's somebody's uncle who happened to be the first person to design a certain type of yacht. Or, uh, oh, did you know that they actually had this weird old tree in their backyard that was one of the only trees and blah, 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 right? Like, sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's architectural, right? If you walk any of those narrow boulevards that girdled Gloucester's downtown, uh, you'll see, you know, hand-lettered signs telling you the names and occupations of, you know, a, a fripperer from 1749 lived here. Uh, and that profound sense of history is one that I think is drawn into sharper and sharper relief as we get into this Gloucester 400th. So tonight, again, we're going to cover a lot of ground, but we're going to specifically focus on five figures. Now, in my sort of uh, uh, advertisement for this lecture, I gave them sort of pithy nicknames. Um, and I want to sort of briefly just go over who they are, what my sort of nickname for them is, what house they built. So we all have that as sort of a framework as we're going through. So on your far left there, there is, and you'll have to trust me on this because actually there are no historical photos of Red Roof in the public domain with a Red Roof, was Red Roof. It was built by A. Pyatt Andrew. We will be calling him the doctor. Next to that one, moving to the right, is Beauport. It was built by Henry Davis Sleeper. We are calling him the curator. Moving uh, on there, you have Fenway Court. Most people will know it as the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, as that is what it's commonly called today. It was built by Isabella Stewart Gardner, and we are calling her the widow. Further to the right, you have a place which, uh, I'm going to be honest, this is not a historical photo of Stillington Hall. This is a modern photo that I made black and white but we'll just ignore that. Uh, it's for color consistency. I'm not trying to deceive you. Stillington Hall. Stillington Hall was built by the actor Leslie Buswell, and we are calling him the actor. Finally, at the far end there, you have a building that should look very familiar to all of you. You're in it. Uh, it is properly called Abadia Mare, uh, but you probably know it as Hammond Castle Museum or Hammond Castle. It was built by John Hayes Hammond Jr., and tonight, we'll be calling John Hayes Hammond Jr. the Sorcerer. I mentioned before that uh, by the time of my town's founding, Gloucester had already passed its bicentennial. And I want to actually step back to that bicentennial, 1823. By 1823, uh, the city of Gloucester had actually already been colonized multiple times. And we're going to talk about precisely what I mean by this, uh, but it's important to have a sense of where we're located in history. By 1823, Mass Connemet, the last Sagamore of the Pawtucket, who, if you were in attendance at the first lecture you heard about, had already been dead and buried on a hill in South Hamilton for 150 years, right? That is the dramatic scale of colonization we're talking about there. Uh, before that, Gloucester had itself been settled twice, once in 1623 by representatives of the Dorchester Company, led by a gentleman by the name of Thomas Gardner, Ignore his last name. It doesn't. It's not going to come up later, for sure. Uh, uh, and they actually gave up on that colony a couple of years later and moved south to Salem. It was then uh, later sort of recolonized in the early 1640s, and that's actually the first time it begins to be called uh, Gloucester, as we know it. That early colony is referred to as like the Cape Ann Colony, uh, 
uh, or something like that. Um, it's been over 200 years by 1823 uh, from Samuel de Champlain's Le Beauport map, which I'm sure, uh, well, I actually shouldn't say I'm sure we've all seen. How many people have seen this map? Uh, so this was done by uh, the explorer Samuel Champlain. Uh, this was done by the explorer Samuel Champlain in 1606. Uh, it depicts Eastern Point uh, here uh, and then the rest of Gloucester Harbor. Now, trust me, trust me, you can get into arguments about what corresponds to what. Some stuff is pretty obvious, like, you know, 10 pound island over there, Rocky Neck over there. Uh, once you start getting into this zone there, uh, you can, as Beth and, and I, Beth, our collections manager, and I have had, you know, hours long discussions about like, well, I think this river is more like the Anasquam, or no, I've always heard it's down here. So trust me, well, we could go over it. But this is the first known sort of European documentation of uh, the land that we uh, now call Gloucester. Uh, Champlain, by the way, described Eastern Point as a tongue of plain ground documented by a, a scattering of, uh, uh, what is it, grapes, vines, and uh, sassafras. You know, it's a very kind of wild place. It even does not have uh, the wigwams that he depicts in the rest of the place. Eastern Point itself uh, is mostly bear hunting and fishing ground. In 1823, 40 years had passed since the American Revolution. And actually, it was in 1823 that James Monroe announced to the world that the Western Hemisphere of the uh, world was closed for colonization. That's the Monroe Doctrine, if you remember your uh, high school history. Uh, historians at large call this era in the country the era of good feeling, because Americans were supposedly united towards a sort of common purpose rather than petty partisan political divides. Sure, that'll that'll last. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um but nobody in Gloucester, which was then a pretty bucolic fishing town, uh, then knew that there was actually going to be a second revolution. And this was not going to be a revolution of guns and sabers, cannons, uh, nor, contrary to what many people kind of interpret it as, was it going to be a revolution of industry? It was primarily going to be a revolution of markets. We call it the market revolution. And it was going to precipitate a resettlement, a recolonization of the North Shore in general and Cape Ann in particular that would put lie to President Monroe's no more colonization doctrine. Local historian Joseph Garland describes this era as the Gold Coast and demarcates it as starting in 1823. You might think that that is because 1823 is the bicentennial, but it just happens to coincide uh, with the opening of a hotel in Nahant. So uh, this is the era of Boston's Gold Coast. And we have some things here. Uh, this over here is uh, yachting. This down here is the Oceanside Hotel and Casino in Magnolia. Uh, over here is the Masconomo House, which uh, is based on the Booth Cottage built by Edwin Junius Booth, uh, the brother of John Wilkes Booth. That's in uh, Manchester. Uh, down here is the Pines in Revere, and here is uh, Revere Beach at the height of the Gold Coast era. Uh, but at first, although they would eventually build these grand hotels and mansions for themselves, uh, the scions of the Gold Coast era were tourists. They came in tents, and they lazily sort of yachted up the coast, finding places to live. Over time, however, uh, it would become a little bit more than that. They built tennis grounds and polo courts. Uh, they uh, started yachting regattas like this one here. This is the Eastern Point Regatta in 1867, I believe. Uh, they, this here is the uh, above the fireplace of the Myopia Hunt Club in Hamilton. Uh, this is a fox hunting society, right? These are the roots and scions of America's growing class of elites. The market revolution is precipitating wealth into the area, and these wealthy are beginning to colonize. They're also practicing, by the way, uh, the hobby that is the oldest and most storied one among America's elite class, tax avoidance. Uh, right? It became a tax avoidance strategy to locate your primary residence on the North Shore, where taxes were lower than in the city, uh, and in an era in which taxes were both uh, smaller and more radical in terms of their scope and size, uh, this was a very effective means of wealth uh, conservation. 
at this point, uh, we should also talk a lot about how it's not only these specific colonizers, and of course, we could name a bunch of them, like Peabody's, Cranes, and Abbott's, and Appleton's, and you know, the list goes on and on. <laughs> I started listing a list when I was uh, making this presentation. I gave up because I was just saying names for, for, for way too long. But we should also talk about the visitors they brought. They brought famous actors and famous painters, all manners of uh, bohemians. And although they range from these like industrial barons to these kind of uh, hard scrabble, uh, you know, uh, poets and stuff like that, they're all in some ways of kind of the same class as the cynical way of looking at it. If you're assembling a who's who of names of people who either lived or visited the North Shore during this area, you can make an alphabetical list uh, from Agassiz to Zimbalist, uh, which I thought was kind of uh, kind of funny. At this point, Eastern Point itself had changed hands a couple times. It had passed through the hands of a wealthy Boston China merchant named Jack Cushing, no relation to the Cardinal Cushing, who is eventually going to become a minor figure uh, in this uh, story of Hammond Castle Museum, uh, to a wealthy Boston businessman named Thomas Niles of Niles Pond, right? Uh, and also, coincidentally, Joseph Garland's uh, great-great-grandfather. That's a whole other thing that feels like I should note it, but doesn't really go anywhere. Uh, however, by the turn of the century, by the time that Gloucester's Gold Coast, uh, Garland's Gold Coast really, was entering its sort of twilight era, uh, Eastern Point had fallen into the hands of a group of developers called the Eastern Point Associates. Uh, some people may have seen this map before. I am remarkably struck by the degree to which this map uh, from 1888 divides Eastern Point like a modern subdivision, right? You have all these sort of plots of land. They went out to what was essentially unsettled farmland, uh, more or less, and began clearing roads and building sites. By the turn of the century, they had built a, a dozen or a slightly more than a dozen cottages. They built a gatehouse. They built a pier. There was uh, Dog Bar Breakwater, which was being worked on, but was not going to be finished until 1905, and a thriving art colony, uh, then establishing itself across all of Cape Ann, uh, was seating its epicenter on Rocky Neck. Not appearing in this film, but kind of over here. It's at this point that the first of our principals, the Doctor, came to settle on Eastern Point. A. Pyatt Andrew. Now, A. Pyatt Andrew, known, uh, actually his real name was Abram Pyatt Andrew Jr., uh, known popularly as A. Pyatt Andrew, uh, or Doc, after receiving a doctorate from Harvard University in economics, uh, was born in Laporte, Indiana. His father was a decorated Civil War soldier and successful banker uh, named A. Pyatt Andrew. His father uh, was a successful businessman. Uh, does anyone want to guess what his name was? A. Pyatt Andrew? Yeah, you're close. It was Abram Pyatt Andrew, so you have uh, you have uh, 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 you have Abram Pyatt Andrew and Abraham Pyatt Andrew. Uh, those are people who are related. Um, people who knew A. Pyatt Andrew when he was younger uh, might be surprised to learn uh, that this guy acquired the nickname Doc or the moniker, as I'm giving him, uh, the Doctor. Right? Uh, A. Pyatt Andrew is actually sort of a delinquent in school. He was expelled from his local Indiana high school, which he had intended for uh, truancy, and was later kicked out of New Jersey's prestigious Lawrenceville Academy uh, for disciplinary reasons. <laughs> Uh, he spent an abortive stint at Wabash College, uh, who, fun fact, Wabash College's only code of conduct for its students is you must behave as a gentleman. So, you know, perhaps. Uh, but eventually he would graduate Princeton in 1893. Uh, by 1901, he purchased a narrow stretch of land out on Eastern Point, uh, and it would serve as the site of his future home. That at that time, he was uh, a Harvard economics professor, one of the old, uh, one of the youngest in the university's history. Uh, in June 1902, work began on said home. It was a three-story uh, chateau, uh, and it was unique amongst its neighbors in that unlike other cottages, and I'm doing big air quotes here on uh, Eastern Point, it had been designed for year-round occupation. It was not one of these uh, kind of summer cottages. Andrew intended to live in it at least uh, a larger portion of the year than most of his contemporaries. As I said before, inconveniently, uh, there are no uh, color historical photographs of this 
uh, building in its historical state. Uh, however, it would not acquire the name Red Roof until 1903. Before then, uh, Andrew referred to it only as uh, his wife uh, or his shanty. Um, but in 1903, the summer of 1903, it would be painted that conspicuous shade of carmine, which uh, we all might be familiar with today, and it received the nickname uh, Red Roof. Now, it's generally reported that Red Roof on the interior was filled with all sorts of secret passageways and peepholes and lofts, and we're going to get back to this a little bit later on when we talk about some of these other houses, uh, but there's reason to believe that might be somewhat exaggerated. Hard to say, though. Uh, we do have a few interior photographs here. These are from Gloucester Daily Times articles after Andrew's death. Uh, this is a sort of library there at Red Roof, uh, and then this is sort of a medieval passageway uh, which led out to a uh, sort of patio garden. Uh, you do have, by the way, that, that patio garden uh, thing there, as well as the pier uh, that was there at the time. I don't know if that figure himself is Andrew, uh, but it was, uh, as Garland describes it, sort of his bachelor castle. Uh, Andrew became close with some people who settled nearby. There's Miss Joanna Davidge, a descendant of Virginian royalty and head of Mrs. Davidge's School for Girls in New York, and her mother, Mrs. MRS's Davidge, uh, who also came to settle there as well. They settled in a house uh, we don't have pictures of, and I'm not going to show, called Pier Lane. Uh, at the same time, the Philadelphian portraitist Cecilia Bowe, uh, along with Miss, Miss, Mr. Uh, Mrs. and Miss Davidge, uh, were early guests at uh, Pyatt Andrews' estate. And uh, Cecilia Bow would later purchase a plot of land slightly near Red Roof uh, and begin breaking ground on a house of her own in 1905 called uh, Green Alley. That was going to serve as sort of a studio space for her. Uh, she had been vacationing in Gloucester for years and years prior to that. Um, finally, they were, this trio was uh, joined by a woman named Carolyn Sidney Sinkler, uh, a widow, although not the widow, don't get too excited yet, uh, 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 who uh, always dressed in purple morning dress, and so her local nickname was the Lavender Lady. She purchased a house uh, near Andrews, which had since fallen into disrepair. We're going to talk a little bit about that later on. I do want to sort of pause here, though, because this group that I just mentioned is one that you might have heard of if you're familiar with local history. Now, you'll hear about Dabsville a lot, and there's some argument over to who specifically is what in the acronym. Uh, D-A-B-S, Dabs here. Uh, but at this point, when we have uh, Dabbage, Andrew, Bo, and Sinkler, we have Dabs. You know, whether or not that's the Dabs we could argue about, there's going to be another S here, uh, next slide, right? Um, but uh, we should sort of consider that this is the original nucleus of that. They form a little compound out on Rocky Neck. They're a sort of dab, a little kind of errant space. They're a little bit insular, unlike the rest of the larger communities of rich people in the up and down the Gold Coast. They're a dab, but they're also Dabsville, right? That is a, a joke that they used. Let's talk about S. The other S, uh, of course, uh, a contestant for the Dabs S, is Henry Davis Sleeper, our curator. Called Harry to those that knew him well, he was born in Boston in 1878. His father, like Andrews, was a decorated Civil War veteran, distinguished military officer. His grandfather was a highly successful textile merchant and real estate magnate, and one of three founders of Boston University. Despite that fact, as you may or may not know, uh, Henry Davis Sleeper here did not acquire a formal education. Rather, uh, he is generally described as a very sickly boy. One story, probably too perfectly fitting the subject here, uh, to be true, is that rather than uh, sort of more traditional education, uh, his parents provided the sickly sleeper with a succession of increasingly more intricate dollhouses, which he could play with. Uh, it would be great if that was true, right? Uh, he was initially a guest of a Pia Andrews at Red Roof. Uh, sleeper like Davidge, Bo, Sinkler before him was sort of drawn into A. Pyatt Andrews' uh, gravitational pull here. Beginning in 1907 and continuing for some 20 years as his vision sort of expanded, uh, Sleeper with his architect Half Dan M. Hansen uh, began to erect his own quote-unquote cottage, a labyrinthine arts and crafts array of rooms and passageways with 
carefully curated context, uh, contents arranged according to a uh, very personal curatorial logic. This is the photo we typically see of Sleeper. This is actually him much younger than any of this would have been happening, right? Uh, this is a picture of Sleeper as he would have been sort of more around the time that these events were transpiring. And this is Apaya Andrew and Henry Davis Sleeper on the stone bench at Red Roof. You're going to be seeing that bench again. But we should talk a little bit about Beauport's exterior and interior architecture. Now, as this sort of started to uh, coalesce, there is the exterior of Beauport uh, there in historical photography. Uh, you can see it's slightly more than the uh, sort of cottage moniker would give it. Uh, he originally called it Little Beauport, uh, but I think quite appropriately he switched to calling it just simply Beauport, right, as his vision expanded. And this is a good example of some historical photos from Henry Davis Sleeper's dollhouse imagination, right? The rooms are sort of meticulously designed and curated and very, very fiddly. A lot of Beauport's initial interior was taken from a 17th century house in nearby Essex, which was sort of imported piecemeal and broken apart. Sort of what people wish Hammond Castle was doing to uh, medieval uh, buildings, although as if you've taken a tour, you know uh, this is new construction. Uh, Beauport is kind of a stitching together of a lot of historical finds of, of sleepers. You know, he and Hansen would go, go around and uh, find things. Now, I wanted to use this picture in the center in particular, uh, because it's particularly interesting where we are located now. So, has any, who here has been to Beauport? Show of hands. Who here has been to this room? This room, as it exists now, doesn't look like this. Uh, now this room is the Chinese trade room, it's called. At the time this photo was taken, uh, this was called uh, the Medieval Hall. Uh, and this was actually later turned into the Chinese trade room. And, oh, I would say that a couple artifacts here in the, this photo can now be found somewhere else. For example, on the left-hand side of the central photo there, you will see an ornate sort of chest, which is right over there in that sort of alcove off the Great Hall. On the right-hand side of the photo, you might see sort of a uh, large German high boy, intricately carved, which is... And trust me, as you're going through the Beauport albums, you start to be like, oh, yeah, okay, I see how that ended up. We should also talk about how Sleeper used his house. This is a little bit different than A. Pyatt Andrew. To Sleeper, Beauport is a little bit of a show house. He never really intended to become a professional interior designer, but he eventually did. His eye and Hafton Hansen's hands, it should be said, were sought out by many of Sleeper's wealthy friends once Beauport came into the fore in order to reproduce elements of Beauport or work it up in a similar style. One of the first of these clients was actually Sinkler next door. She actually had the house uh, in between Red Roof and Beauport, and she enlisted Sleeper's help very early on to help decorate it, as well as Andrew's help in helping to electrically wire it. That's a whole other thing. Uh, but it can be said that Carolyn Sinkler was maybe Sleeper's first real client in that regard. Uh, this might be why her house, which I've avoided naming until now, was eventually christened by her, uh, it must be said, uh, as Wrong Roof in between Red Roof and Beauport there. So we're looking at Beauport through the eye of Sleeper's kind of dollhouse imagination, right? It's meticulously curated, carefully so, uh, and it's designed as sort of the show house for his interior decoration business. We're going to hop backwards in time a little bit. Beauport is completed in 1907. It's really being worked on uh, for another 20 years until even like 1928 is when the last major addition is made. The doctor, A. Pyatt Andrew, met the widow, Isabella Stewart Gardner, in 1903, the same year that Red Roof received its Red Roof and therefore its name. Uh, he was 30. She, 63. He was sort of a scion of a new age. She, the undisputed queen regent of one that was then departing. Uh, she actually met Andrew through Bo, who secured an invitation to uh, this new uh, place that Isabella Stewart Gardner had been working on for years, much anticipated, rising out of the fens. Uh, she called it uh, Fenway Court. That was one spring afternoon in 1903. The widow was born Isabella Stewart Gardner in uh, Isabella Stewart in 1840. 
Uh, she was the daughter of a wealthy textile merchant. In 1860, she married John Lowell Gardner, who went by Jack, uh, who was a direct descendant of Thomas Gardner. Remember him from earlier? Now, the Gardner family has uh, been fairly prominent uh, throughout this history ever since Thomas Gardner landed in the Cape Ann colony. Uh, but they are by no means the reason why the Gardner, uh, Stuart Gardner house was particularly wealthy. And that was through uh, John Lowell Gardner's mother, who was a Peabody, uh, one of the most wealthy American merchant shipping families in the world. Uh, they never had any kids, uh, although they, they did have a kid. Uh, he sadly passed away. And so the couple took to... Um, collecting, specifically traveling the world, using their social collection uh, connections and monetary resources uh, to accumulate a vast collection of Renaissance art, become great patrons of the art. In 1898, the same year Jack Gardner died, Mrs. Jack, as she was often known, or the Queen of Back Bay, uh, began erecting the building that would really become her most lasting legacy. Architecturally inspired, uh, particular in its central atrium by a Renaissance-era Venetian palace, Gardner was exacting and meticulous in imposing a strict sort of curatorial logic and singular aesthetic vision within Fenway Court. There are all these legends about how nothing can be changed lest the whole collection be boxed up and shipped overseas. The acoustics of the music hall there are said to have been tested by students from the Perkins School of the Blind so that nobody would see her dramatic acoustic vision uh, before it was ready to be completed. When Andrew first visited Fenway Court in 1903, John Singer Sargent, a uh, contemporary of Cecilia Bowe, uh, also very well-known figure in his own right, uh, was in residence with Mrs. Jack. Uh, but the widow did not actually visit uh, Dabsville until 1907. It was in 1907 that Sleeper, encouraged by Andrew, was beginning to look at that Choate house in Essex that he was going to turn into Beauport. And the first record of Gardner visiting Beauport is she, uh, Sleeper, Andrew, and Davidge motoring out there on the dusty road to sort of visit that dilapidated Essex house. Uh, by 1908, Mrs. Jack had acquired yet another nickname. Why? Just, just the letter Y. And this was almost exclusively used by this Dabsville set. She called Andrew A, he called her Y, everybody else called her Y. She had a draped purple uh, throne with a big golden letter Y on the back that they expected her to sit on when she came over. Uh, she was a sort of new nucleus uh, for this set. Uh, she brought in Bernard Berenson, Okakura Kakuzo, Morris Carter, all these famous sort of art world people into this insular uh, Dabsville uh, kind of dab. Uh, when Andrew was called by the National Monetary Commission to travel throughout Europe later in 1908, uh, he actually asked why Isabella Stewart Gardner to become the steward of his mansion, and she became sort of the mistress of Red Roof at his request. Who else, of course, was going to look after the two pet black bears, gold and silver, uh, that Sleeper had gifted him uh, and which now occupied a large portion of the lawn of Red Roof? Uh, by the way, there are some very funny letters from Isabella Stewart Gardner uh, where she writes to Andrew that she was getting, rest, uh, getting dressed today and looking out at the bears playing. Uh, they're always watching me when I'm getting dressed. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, now, uh, Green Alley... Beauport, all are thriving during this period. Red Roof is socially thriving under Isabella Stewart Gardner's kind of maveny watch. Uh, all the while, across Gloucester Bay, a little bit geographically removed from Dabsville, a sorcerer is beginning his work. In 1903, a fellow by the name of John Hayes Hammond Sr., a wealthy mining engineer, former landlord, uh, uh, one of the sort of landowners in South Africa involved with the gold rush there, a counselor to presidents, including William Howard Taft there. By the way, this photograph here uh, is signed up there for Mrs. Gardner from your friends, John Hayes Hammond Sr. and William Howard Taft, uh, right? Uh, Hammond Sr. establishes a summer compound in Gloucester. Hammond Sr. is by then an established political ally and sometimes rival of Isabella Stewart Gardner's beloved nephew, Augustus Gussie P. Gardner, who's the congressman from this area, uh, although uh, not quite at that time uh, yet. Um, meanwhile, the young John Hayes Hammond Jr. peeking out there 
And also, if you can get him, he's behind Taft. That's John Hayes Hammond Jr. And then two people over, that's Gardner there uh, in a photo. Uh, John Hayes Hammond Jr. comes to settle at his parents' summer home. He is living in a uh, sort of small uh, manse there that they called the bungalow. It's not yet the building that you're probably familiar with from the view from Stage 4 Park. It truly is kind of a bungalow. He sets up a laboratory there. He had always... Uh, he had, he had just uh, graduated from Yale University Sheffield Scientific School after a stint at Lawrenceville Academy, like a Pi Andrew. Um, and he started associating with the Dabsville uh, set. He also, by the way, went by Jack, like his father and like Isabella Stewart Gardner's uh, former husband. Uh, and he had always wanted to live in a castle. His own later account recalls that it was while living in Eastbourne, Kent, and attending boarding school in the 1890s that he sort of fell in love with Gothic castles and cathedrals. Um, and he actually said that he found it disgraceful, not to say dull, uh, that the family did not occupy an authentic Gothic castle while living there. Uh, his father, Hammond Sr., much preferred to live with the uh, relatively convenient plumbing of a Georgian-style mansion. <laughs> uh, he was living in this small bungalow on Lookout Hill. This is after it is uh, sort of renovated somewhat. And you'll see over there on the right that Hammond has to a photo of the bungalow added a uh, sort of potential dream tower there uh, in pencil. Uh, I also wanted to use some photos from the interior of the bungalow uh, because you'll notice some organ facades over there which might also be seen directly behind you, as well as a large choir stall uh, and a piano. Uh, so that should, again, speak to the level at which these people are kind of shifting major acquisitions around their uh, sort of various properties. Um, this smaller building down here is Radio Point or Point Radio. You'll hear different names depending on the source, but it's where John Hayes Hammond Jr. Uh, would begin sort of his most important uh, work and become one of America's most prolific and remarkable inventors. Electronic Sorcerer, I didn't just make that up. Uh, John Hayes Hammond Jr. Uh, was widely renowned as an inventor's inventor. Uh, he made major contributions to radio control, navigation, audio reproduction, uh, telephony, television, musical instrumentations, acoustics, consumer appliances. We could go on and on. Hey, we could do a whole tour about Hammond's inventions, right? I certainly know someone who could. <laughs> Uh, this is where I have to be very careful not to get too far into the weeds on Hammond. Um, he, his defining innovations earned him names like the Electronic Sorcerer and, uh, no joke in a more contemporary newspaper article, the Wonderful Wizard of Gloucester. Sources disagree as to how and when the actor made his entrance onto the scene. Uh, by some accounts, Henry Leslie Farmer Buswell, uh, who that set called Boo, or Boozy, uh... <laughs> Uh, and John Hayes Hammond Jr. met on a boat by chance. Hammond invited him to sort of come to uh, uh, look uh, Lookout Hill, his parents' house up the road, uh, and that is where their sort of bond formed. Other sources have it that, well, Andrew, who was a professional actor, hence the, hence the subtitle there, was on a tour of the United States. He was approached by the kind of uh, maveny gardener, right, who sort of drew him into what was then at that time an extremely thriving amateur theater scene in Gloucester. Whatever the case, uh, it can be said a couple things in addition to sort of some speculation. One uh, is that by... Uh, the sort of early 19-teens, uh, Buswell was living with Jack Hammond at the bungalow, and he was also employed by him as his agent and business manager, despite the fact that Leslie Buswell was an actor and not a radio control specialist, right? Um, he was starring in theatrical productions across the city from Red Roof, Green Alley. This photo here is of him in a G.K. Chesterton play at uh, Lookout Hill, Hammond's parents' house. Uh, and Buswell and Hammond actually began the process then of remodeling the bungalow into Jack's vision of this sort of castellated home. Unfortunately, or fortunately as the case may be, circumstances would conspire uh, that neither of those two men got to occupy the house that they would renovate. 
Uh, Hammond was kicked out by his parents. You will hear various reasons as to why, but not least of which was his scandalous courtship of the daughter of an Eastern Point yacht designer by the name of Archibald Fenton, uh, named Irene Fenton, who was divorced from a Gloucester shoe salesman named Frederick Reynolds. Uh, you know, we could talk about Hammond's parental feud for a long time, but suffice to say that by the mid-1920s, Hammond is living in Italy concerned that his parents are going to disinherit him if he returns to the United States. He's left Leslie Buswell, his agent, in charge of his business affairs, chief of which is the construction of his own folly home, Abadia Mare. Abadia Mare comes from the Latin for Abbey from the Sea or Abbey by the Sea. Uh, you can see some early pictures of Abadia Mare here, including one of my favorites. Uh, it's the one on the far right there. Uh, this one is taken from uh, sort of our neighbor's property over there. It's an angle most people don't get to see of sort of the courtyard glass. I also picked this photo of it in the phase of construction because you may not know it, but you're about right there. Yeah, you're about you're about right there. Uh, that's taken from uh, over there. Now, Abadi Amare was to be sort of decorated with a variety of antiques that Hammond had already collected or inherited from decorations at the bungalow. Uh, there were going to be new finds that Hammond acquired well in uh, Rome and sort of incorporated into the building. Uh, there was also going to be one of the country's largest residential pipe organs. He envisioned a laboratory, a home, a museum of architecture, artifacts, atmosphere. Uh, rather uh, than, he is very specific in stating, one of tapestry and art. You can imagine who in particular he was thinking of when he made that statement, right? Uh, he didn't want to compete in the realm of art collecting because it was expensive, and uh, he just didn't have the resources to build a Fenway Court-esque art museum, but he did have the ability to incorporate, you know, elements of Gothic and Romanesque castles, uh, cathedrals, Renaissance chateau, ancient Roman ruins. Simultaneously, Leslie Buswell purchased a large swath of land in the Ravenwood, uh, dammed a creek to enlarge what is now Buswell's Pond, and began building his own Jacobean manse uh, and home and theatrical venue. He would call it Stillington Hall, after a large manor house in his native England. Uh, and he and Hammond would actually share and swap interior elements purchased while Hammond uh, was abroad. Uh, so over there you have uh, Stillington Hall. These are modern photographs. There are actually not too many historical photos of Stillington Hall because it's kind of up in the woods. It's a little bit to get it's a little bit difficult to get complete pictures of it. There are some contemporary pictures in the archive of the Cape Ann Museum. If you're really interested, I recommend you check those out. But Stillington Hall has not changed that much, at least exteriorly. On the interior there, you can see Christmas cards from Buswell to Hammond. Uh, that is the sort of theatrical uh, room in Stillington Hall, the stage room. Uh, and then that is a, a sort of colonial parlor. Now, you might have heard of Bath. Right, this this other acronym in addition to Dabsville that comes from Buswell, Andrew, Sleeper, and Hammond. In addition to Davidge and Sinclair and Bo and all those other sort of Dabsville folks we talked about. Uh, there is no contemporary basis that I can find to support the claim that the Bash people referred to themselves as such, but it's sort of entered the local lexicon just as much as Dabsville, and it certainly speaks to a level at which these men were connected, if not by sort of the geographical boundaries of Dabsville, by a common kind of uh, sense of purpose. Now, I also want to talk briefly about the fact uh, that a lot of these people were in romantic relationships with each other. You know, it's common knowledge that there was an erotic element to this sort of uh, huge community. I, I say huge, this, you know, modestly sized community uh, of Gold Coast elites. But the precise dimensions and, uh, you know, uh, historical fact of this nature is a little bit difficult to define. It's often wildly exaggerated by local gossip and uh, what should be said is tacitly homophobic innuendo. You'll hear a lot of stories where a window becomes a salacious peephole, a loft becomes like a secret bordello, a nude statue, which they've been making for 3,000 years, becomes like some esoteric erotica, uh, a costume party becomes like a libertine bacchanal. Uh, you know, certainly queerness was a central force uh, in the relationship between these individuals, right? The Sleeper McCann House, the uh, museum which now occupies Beauport, uh, is, for the past decade, been openly acknowledging the sexual and romantic relationship between uh, 
Henry Davis Sleeper and A. Pi Andrew. A lot of modern scholarship on Cecilia Bowe and John Singer Sargent, for that matter, who was a frequent guest of the Dabsville crowd, uh, center of sort of queer theoretical frameworks. Uh, you know, it's definitely a major part of that relationship. And this area is worthy of serious and continued critical analysis. It just deserves to be expanded from a theoretical aspect, particularly in the context of how our cape uh, relates to enclaves like Provincetown, which relatively contemporaneously to this are becoming the destination for LGBT plus Americans uh, on Cape Cod. Uh, yet to frame the members of Dabs, Bash, etc., cetera, uh, primarily by this variable and varied queerness, particularly without any sort of academic theoretical framework or understanding of the greater history, uh, really discounts other powerful kind of political economic alliances which bound them together. Uh, I wanted to sort of highlight this point because I do think that's an area that's worthy of further analysis, expanded analysis, and should be. But I also don't think in doing that we should become so sort of involved with our own kind of uh, local gossip about things uh, that we sort of turn away from actual serious academic analysis of the history. In late 1914, actually not long after he arrived in America, Leslie Boswell followed A. Pia Andrew, who by that time, in, additional, uh, in addition to his work overseas, had served as the director of the U.S. Mint and assistant secretary of the U.S. Treasury in the Taft administration, uh, and had actually unsuccessfully tried to primary Gussie Gardner, Isabella's favorite nephew in 1914, uh, in volunteering to drive ambulances on the front of World War I. Uh, you have them there in their American field service uniforms. Uh, in some ways, Andrew was Buswell's boss. You also have a pick portrait of uh, uh, Buswell by Cecilia Bowe uh, there. This is in the archives of the Cape Ann Museum. Literally, it, if you are at one of the scanners, it looms over you quite aggressively uh, back, there in the, back there in the library. You also have uh, Hammond and Sleeper down there wearing military uniforms that were, it should be said, not theirs. In fact, there's some speculation that the uniform that Hammond is wearing in that picture is Buswell's. You know, I can't, we can't confirm or deny that, but uh, certainly they're all involved. The members of this Dabsville bash set who did not travel overseas to fight in World War I, or rather drive ambulances on the front of World War I, uh, did fundraise quite prodigiously uh, for that. And although, unlike Buswell and Andrew, they did not win, like, the uh, cross of war, uh, they did receive a number of accolades for their World War I work, in particular Hammond and his military uh, inventions. Uh now, we're coming to the end of the Gold Coast era. World War I is not the final blow in this, but it's a significant one. Uh, Garland identifies the Great Depression as being the thing that kind of cements the end of the Gold Coast era, but we're going to talk about why that's a little bit tricky. In 1918, Gussie Gardner died, and by 1921, Apia Andrew uh, would actually occupy uh, that congressional seat. There was a brief interlude there, but, you know, we don't. He doesn't matter. Basically, Gussie Gardner, then A. Pi and Andrew is the important progression there. Uh, in 1924, Isabella herself died. And Buswell and Andrew and Sleeper and Hammond were in attendance at her funeral in Fenway Court. Some sources say they were pallbearers. They don't look to be bearing palls to me, but, you know, who, who knows how the funeral arrangements were. Certainly, they were a major part of the uh, funeral service. Um, Stillington Hall was, according to some sources, uh, completed in 1925. A lot of times it's difficult because there were like later editions, so that makes the number a little bit squishy. Uh, Beauport, by all even the most liberal reckonings, was finished in 1928. And in 1929, Abadi Amare, which could be called the last and perhaps the ultimate of the great Gold Coast houses, uh, was, by all definitions, or some, finished. Like Red Roof, it was the private home of a man with a reputation for vast intelligence and wit. It was initially imagined with all manners of uh, Andrew's fabled secret passageways and peepholes and secret doors, right? Uh, there are none in the building as it uh, exists. I mean, there's one down in the wine cellar, right? But it's certainly not this, uh, you know, Scooby-Doo-esque mystery house. Uh, as, by the way, Red Roof is often portrayed, and that, by the way, is why I'm suspicious of the notion that Red Roof was uh, some sort of Scooby-Doo-esque mystery house, because we are not, and people frequently say we are. Um, 
like Beauport, it housed an eclectic array of carefully selected and repurposed antiques. Some, it is said, hand-selected by Sleeper himself to occupy this place. Like Fenway Court, it was designed to evoke the atmosphere of a uh, European uh, piazza, right? It is designed to feel like you're in this place. Uh, like Stillington Hall, it carries a sense of the theatrical, musical, and literary imagination. Gardner's work at Fenway Court seems to loom especially large. Anybody who's been to our courtyard beyond those doors there frequently remarks uh, how similar it is. Hammond's courtyard is perhaps more rustic village than Venetian palace. Uh, his galleries are more filled with stone and furniture than the paintings of Renaissance masters. Uh, and although Hammond uh, actually consulted the framework of Gardner's will when he was setting up his museum in the year 1930, uh, Museum Corporation, by the way, of which Apey and Andrew was the first vice president, uh, this place definitely feels rougher, right? More lived in. You know, Isabella Stewart Gardner lived in Fenway Court, but she lived in an apartment, like, on the front, kind of separated. This was a place where, as I was telling you earlier, sir, Hammond had his before-dinner cocktails, never to excess. Nobody remembers him drinking to excess, but over in the sunroom, right? It's a place where he had his coffee in the morning and his hour-long baths in the early afternoon. This place is plainly homoousian, which means of the same substance, right? As a dozen of other mansions up and down the Gold Coast, right? Not just these Eastern Point Dabsville houses. It's of the same stuff as these things. You could talk about close-knit and bohemian Dabsville denizens. You could talk about Peabody's and sergeants, cranes and lodges, abbots and fricks. You know, the cynical view was that the thing that binds this all together is money. And there is a certain value to that. I even sort of intoned that earlier when we were talking about how the market revolution is the basis of this sort of Gold Coast phenomenon and the thing that makes Eastern Point Eastern Point, right? I have thrown a number of not entirely subtle references to the fact that all these people were the scions of, you know, textile merchants and China merchants and businessmen and bankers and landlords and gold miners, right? Uh, these are wealthy people. And the cynical view might be that these houses, despite their superficial differences, are really not all that distinct, right? Whether they have gargoyles or gables, piers or promenades, archways or antiquities, despite their unique collections, whether they're designed in sort of a fancy au courant, uh, in vogue style, or the style of a 15th century French Gothic cathedral, they're more similar than they are different in sort of their economic basis. This cynical view is sort of valuable in some cases, uh, but not the whole picture. And it discounts the way in which each of these houses was a singular reflection of its builder and how those reflections, as we understand them as a community that has a profound sense of our own history within this sort of tapestry of ourselves. Red Roof was a bachelor's castle. A young Franklin Roosevelt, who, by the way, A. Pied Andrew was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Economics I professor. Uh, that's kind of a fun little uh, side note. Uh, uh, you know, attended Harvard stag parties at Red Roof. It doesn't exist anymore. There's something that they call Red Roof. It has a Red Roof. But the building that A. Pied Andrew built has long been mostly hollowed out and almost completely replaced. Fenway Court is as it was intended to be one of the premier collections of art and culture in this country. And why Isabella's, Isabella, Mrs. Jack, resplendently casts her shadow across every gallery of that place. I'm sure some of you were hoping that I'd talk about some of those shadowy aspects of Isabella Stewart Gardner much more, you know, but certainly that is a place that is steeped in her. Beauport is as popular a showcase of uh, Sleeper and Hafton Hansons, uh, eye and hand as it ever was, an eye for detail, a craftsmanship. Stillington Hall is tucked away on a high hill over here back in the woods. It's a private residence, and like its founder, Leslie Buswell, it has, in comparison to these other buildings, somewhat faded from the public imagination. Finally, a body of mare, an idiosyncratic creation, an eclectic pudding of a building, uh, stands as the home of a self-proclaimed medievalist 
who nevertheless developed the technological antecedents of the space race and the Cold War. In some ways, these houses loom large, larger even in our past than things like Mascumset's grave, Champlain's map, our own 400th anniversary, any other discrete cultural unit of our history. These are sites which collect and focus our collective cultural beliefs and feelings, some proud, some critical, some complicated about our past. The Gold Coast did not end because the money which tied its constituents together vanished in the Great Depression. That was Garland's consensus, and it's where I think he goes majorly wrong. The culture itself shifted. When John Hayes Hammond Jr. died in 1965, the last of his Dabsville bash contemporaries, the world was a profoundly different one culturally than the one into which he was born and the one in which the first stones of Red Roof were laid in 1901. The means and mechanisms for us to create another Abadi Amare, another Stillington, another Beauport, another Fenway Court, and another Red Roof certainly exist, right? People are richer today than they ever were, even at the height of the Gilded Age. People could build another building like this today. But without our own doctor, widow, curator, actor, or sorcerer to animate their orbits, to haunt these places, I have to wonder, and this is where I'm going to conclude us, what will they be talking about? Will they be talking about our homes? Will they be talking about us at the 500th anniversary? That's it. I think I'm supposed to take questions now if you got them. Was uh, Fenway Court in a swamp? And the answer is yes, it was built in a swamp. Yeah, the Back Bay Fens then are essentially pretty remote. Nowadays, you know, because there's a tea station about 50 feet away, we don't really think of that as being kind of out in the sticks. But when Gardner was building it, it definitely was. Yeah, for sure. Other questions? Oh, yeah, almost sure. Uh, not almost, just, it's certain. Um, you know, I don't know, as I said, the precise dimensions of those, that relationship. Uh, I have read extensive letters between the two. They are certainly romantic in nature, and I think it's fair to say that they, uh, almost certainly had a sexual relationship as well. Uh, although I would also say that, um, in my analysis of Hammond is that he was not particularly physically affectionate in general. He wrote a lot about how he liked sleeping alone. Uh, for example, uh, they would eventually have a major falling out, Buswell and Hammond, over money in the early 1930s, uh, and it was a pretty uh, pretty nasty one. Hammond was at one point uh, trying to, uh, or looking at the possibility of suing Buswell for mismanaging his funds while Buswell was essentially his agent. Uh, we don't actually know how that really resolved. Uh, it doesn't seem like he ended up suing him, and it seemed like his lawyers advised against it, but certainly that relationship uh, did not end on good terms, although uh, by all accounts, when Buswell died in late 1964, his widow remembered receiving a nice note from Hammond, who would himself die not long thereafter. Uh, Sleeper never married, Andrew never married, although he did have a long-term courtship with a woman. The precise nature of that is really difficult to tease out. Uh, Buswell married and had a child named Peter Buswell, who some locals might have met at some point. I hear sometimes like, oh, I know Peter Buswell. Uh, and Hammond and his wife Irene never had any kids, uh, uh, you know, for various reasons we could get into it. Um, but yes, Hammond and Buswell were married. Buswell is the only one of that set to ever have any children. Although it should be said that I believe Davidge was married during the time uh, of that sort of Dabsville affair. In fact, I, I know she was. Uh, she married a man during that uh, phase. Excellent question. Yeah. Uh, from the year 1930 on till his death in 1965, this was his primary residence. It's where, uh, you know, he, he would spend a lot of time on his boats. He loved sailing. Uh, he'd spend a lot of time at his New York apartment. Um, but this is where he filled out the census and his taxes. It's not where he died. He actually did die in New York while there to attend an RCA board meeting. And that's one of the reasons why his cause of death is a little bit mysterious, because Manhattan has very strict laws about releasing death certificates. Um... But he was eventually buried here in the Aztec-style mausoleum of his own design that was slightly up the coast with his mummified cats. Some of which were stolen. <laughs>
Any other questions? Yeah, in the back there. Red Roof. Uh, yeah, so the question is, does Red Roof still exist? Red Roof sort of still exists. So there is a house. It's the second one there. Uh, theoretically called Red Roof. It has a red roof, as you can see. Checks out so far. Uh, but it's really only kind of a facsimile of what was there. I do believe they retain some of the original, uh, like one original wall or or section or something like that. Uh, but mostly the building has itself been replaced. The the people that did that uh, do claim in articles I've read that they attempted to sort of retain Andrew's vision, at least for the exterior. And it does, you know, it does check out. It looks very similar, at least at a glance, to uh, kind of what was originally done. But I get the sense that uh, far more so than any of these other houses that you can see on screen right now, that's one that's been significantly altered. Uh, and it is one of two that didn't ever really serve as a uh, actually, even Stillington Hall did serve as a public venue, so it's the only one that was never a venue of any kind, was never really open to the public in, in, in that sense, as all the others were. Yeah. So, not that much. At the time the bridge was christened a Piet Andrew Bridge, he had been dead for 14 years, which is a lot, but not, you know, it took a long time to build that bridge. It was a big deal when they built it. So he would have still very much been in the public memory. And he was also a local congressman who died in office. So, you know, that might give him a little bit of largesse in terms of urban planning and the desire to memorialize him. Um, yes, uh, that uh, Apide Andrew Bridge, for those of you who don't know, is uh, where 128 comes into comes into Gloucester. It wasn't built until 1950. So it's funny that you asked that, because earlier today I was speaking to someone and I said, if I had to do this presentation again, uh, I might put Green Alley in the sort of in the mix. Green Alley is a little bit different for a couple of reasons. One, Cecilia Bow, although she is kind of a Gloucester fixture, she's obviously a Dabsville uh, kind of uh, centerpiece. Uh, she's also more nationally known. She's very closely identified with the city of Philadelphia, for example, whereas all the other people who come here, with the exception of Gardner, uh, kind of become uniquely Gloucesterian, right? They become part of the fabric of our local history. Green Alley was a reflection of her, right? It embodies her. She was meticulous in designing it, uh, right? All these sort of other things we've talked about. It's a venue as a portraiture studio, uh, in much the same way that uh, uh, Stillington Hall is like a theatrical venue. Um, so it would fit really well into this sort of assemblage. One, you know, we already went over with five houses, six houses is a lot. Uh, and two, there is a lot less sort of public resources about Green Alley specifically. Um, I mean, there's barely enough on Stillington Hall, right, uh, in terms of photographs and stuff like that. And Green Alley is, if anything, even more marginal in terms of a lot of work that's been done on it itself. So uh, the shorter answer to your question, which is, does Green Alley kind of fit into this framework, is yes. Um, but there's some problems with sort of applying the same, same mode to it. Yeah, but I think that's a fair uh, kind of uh, desire for an expanded uh, potentially version of this same talk. Um, someone over here had a question. Yeah. Uh, so as I understand the question, um, I, I believe you're referring to the Colonial Arms Hotel uh, on Eastern Point. The question is whether or not the Colonial Arms was something or uh, sorry, what the relationship between the Dabsville set and the Colonial Arms folks were. Yeah. So over there, you see like the Oceanside Hotel that was in Magnolia. If somebody told somebody today who would just drive through Magnolia that it once had one of the largest hotels and casinos in this area in it, they'd be like, was it by this convenience store or this uh, <laughs> this this lovely cafe? Magnolia is great. I, I don't mean to demean Magnolia. It just doesn't give off like roaring 20s vibes, uh, <laughs> at least today. Um <laughs> And the Colonial Arms was a lot like that. It was a massive, massive hotel down there uh, by this Dabsville set. Now, uh, conveniently for Henry Davis Sleeper, uh, it burned down. Uh, now, this is uh, a, a story with a lot of kind of local lore around it. Uh, it burned down when nobody was there over winter while they were doing work on Beauport. And there's always been an insinuation that potentially some workers from Beauport had a fire going or something like that, and that's the only explanation for how the Colonial Arms could have burned down. There's also a lot of, I think, not particularly based in, you know, reality, 
uh, local history about how, uh, you know, thrilled uh, Sleeper and, and Andrew and all those guys were that they no longer had this large looming hotel next to them. I've never read any primary sources where they're like, great, the colonial arms burned down in a massive fire. Uh, but there is this sort of insinuation that that was helpful to their sort of atmospheric vision of like a, a, a plain air paradise out on Eastern Point. I don't know if that's really supported by evidence, um, but certainly there has always been that insinuation that the construction of Beauport was in some way responsible for the destruction of the Colonial Arms Hotel. Yeah, Sinclair's house, wrong roof. Yeah, there's been a succession of like fires and stuff like that. I, I, I am not local enough or old enough that I can, you know, remember like, oh, there was a fire here that destroyed most of this building or something like that. Um, I do know that there has been a succession of kind of destructions and rebuilding and remodeling over the years, particularly of those more, I, you know, hate to say it, but sort of ancillary houses we're talking about, like your green alleys, your wrong roofs, your pier lanes, right? Those are houses that were not so much in the public imagination and so were altered a lot and, you know, damaged in that way. You know, it would be major, major, major news if, for example, Beauport, you know, went up in flames, uh, you know. Right. Like, I, you know, but, um, you know, something like Pier Lane, something like Wrong Roof, you know, could have had minor structural damage, major structural damage and has been, uh, you know, uh, sort of altered over the years. And it would be difficult as something to research because it's not something that would necessarily be in the historical record. So uh, that's sort of my own fault there in terms of not looking more into the more contemporary history. Do you have a question? Uh, so that's, that's a sort of multiple part question. Uh, lots of stuff going on there. Um, yes, Hammond was, a uh, so the question is, was Hammond ever disinherited? Because I mentioned that he was afraid that he was. The short answer is no, he never was. Uh, the long answer was, you know, family politics. Uh, Hammond's mother was the one that had, uh, by all accounts, particular op opposition to, uh, his marriage to Irene Fenton Hammond. Um, it seems at some point in the late 1920s, they sort of made up about that. It might have had to do with the fact that he officially announced that he had been married for a while rather than that he was looking to get married. And she maybe considered that a little bit of a lost battle. It's probably a good thing for Hammond's purposes that his mom dies first of his two parents, right? Like, you know, that that's that's not lost on me there. Uh, his father's, so his mom writes him a letter that's like, oh, my dear boy, you break this poor old woman's heart. What are you doing? You know, I, I have to kick you out. And his dad sends a letter, like, along with it that's like, I just want you to know, I agree with your mother, right? Uh, but, but we know from the records that his dad was still letting him draw on his trust fund. And actually, Hammond sourced funding from this from a couple different places, including some very interesting ones. I don't want to get too far into that tonight. Uh, but uh, all I'll say is, like, look forward in the future for some potential getting into some of Hammond's funding sources here. There is one in particular that's very fascinating. Uh, and I'll sort of tease that there. We'll sort of wrap it up. Uh, thank you.